Last time we treated uh, double slit diffraction and at that time I pointed out when we were looking at the interference patterns that there was a, uh, a bit of a variation in bright and dark zones and I promised that I would get to that and we will get to that in this video. But first I want to introduce single slit diffraction by showing how physical considerations um, kind of dictate the layout of virtually every little tourist trappy town you have ever seen on the coast of the Great Lakes. So let's say the beach is over here. Um, usually you'll see um, coming off the beach There'll be a seawall going into the lakes like so, and usually at the end of one of these seawalls will be a lighthouse, and at the end of the other seawall will be some sort of day-shaped marker um, to allow boats to navigate in and out of the, uh, uh, out of the area. <clears throat> now, waves will be coming in to the uh, into the harbor like so. But if you but interestingly, if if you track back, it's not straight back. You'll notice that as you go back a bit like so here and a bit like so here, at an angle um, and I probably should here let me actually make the entrance to the harbor a little narrower my apologies here there we go so lighthouse and day marker um, it's not straight back, but it's back at a bit of an angle or so like this from here and again like there. And usually what you'll notice is along this zone, this is where the public beach slash village park is. And then right here will be the hobby horse that the Optimist Club installed in the 1950s. Then on the other side of the village park will be the state highway, like so. And then on the other side of the state highway, it'll depend, there'll be a parking lot over here. Um, and then depending on whether the uh, town has gotten itself all kitschy or not either this is going to be like some sort of basic family dining restaurant or something like that or more likely nowadays this will have turned into a strip mall where you have uh, kitschy souvenirs and somebody makes a cappuccino or something and then right here, having refused to never leave since the place was built in the 1950s, there is still a Dairy Twist right here. It's never Dairy Queen. It's, it's some random mom and pop Dairy Twist place. All right. On either side of the village park, one side will usually be the private marina. And then the other side will be the public docks. And it could be in either order here. Now, the question is, is why is the marina here? You know, why are the why are the ships tied up here and here? And we leave all this empty space here. Um the you know why would we have the park right in the middle well, of course you can imagine straight in the middle here the waves are still coming in so this isn't necessarily a good spot to tie up boats but why does it bleed off 
Well, it turns out that the waves kind of, kind of have an interference pattern. And this line here and this line here are the first destructive minima. There will be waves in this region here and here, but they are much, much lower than what's hitting the park. And so the boats just kind of move up and down in the docks just a few centimeters. Whereas here, if you've got a good storm coming in, um, this area here could get really pounded. So since it's not suitable to make the whole area boats, you go ahead and you stick the village park right here. Then, of course, since the village park is here, that's why you end up getting the little strip mall over here. And since the little hobby horse from the Optimist Club was here and you want to give the kids an ice cream, that's why the Dairy Twist ended up over there. I still have not totally figured out why the hobby horse is always right here, but it is. All right, so let's get into this in a little more detail. So it's not just, tr this phenomenon is called single slit diffraction. It's not just true for water waves, it's also true for light waves. And so let's go ahead and analyze it here. So here is our single slit. We will say that the width of our slit is A. Um, and again, we will have plane waves of light impinging on it. Now, by Young's principle, um, sorry, by Huygens principle, um, every point here in the slit will act as a point of wave, as a source of wavelets. So let's go ahead and um, take a look at what happens here. So if I look at, say, the first destructive minimum in the pattern, and I'll show pictures of this in a minute. In dead center, we'll still have a central max. But now here, let's look at these points right here on the end, dead center, and in the end. To have a um, destructive minimum, we can follow the rays of light heading out to here, and from here, and from here. And in order to have destructive interference, um, this one here is going to have an extra half wavelength to this one here. Um, and then similarly here, this one will have an extra wavelength compared to the first. Now, all of these, again, it's going to be like before, where we say that the... Um, this distance L is much bigger than our slit width A. <clears throat> and so as a result, we will go ahead and make the same approximation we did before of saying that these rays are all very nearly parallel. So this is an extra half wavelength here causing destructive interference. And these two will also destructively interfere. Um, so if these are nearly parallel, then this means that we can get away with dropping what is nearly a perpendicular, just like we did before with uh, Young's experiment. And so then this will be an extra wavelength. And if this were the second minimum, it would be two wavelengths, three wavelengths, so forth. So a lot of books will just use M again. Other books will use P. In this case here, I'll use P. So P could be equal to 1 two, three, four, etc. Central maximum would correspond to p equals zero, but that will end up being a bright spot. And again, this will be symmetric, so we'll have a first minimum over here too. All right, so we looked at these points here, and I picked them that, so that they were a over two apart. Now it turns out if we pick any other pair of points that are also A over 2 apart, like let's say these here, 
um, again, because everything here is nearly parallel, <coughs> it'll be the case that this path here is again an extra half wavelength. So you can go all the way along here and at this first minimum, the uh, we can find pairs of points, uh, a collection of pairs of points where the one distance is an extra half wavelength compared to the other, or one and a half, or two and a half, or whatever. Um, and you'll end up getting destructive interference. So, again, so if we go ahead and say that uh, this right here is our angle theta, we can say for destructive interference, oops, that a sine theta is uh, equal to p lambda and again p equals one two and so forth and again if we say that here it'll be typically the case that theta will usually be small So if we do this in radians, we can say that the sine of theta is approximately the tangent of theta is approximately theta. And so that will give us, um, after rearranging this and substituting theta for sine theta, that the angle of the pth interference minimum is P lambda over A. And similarly, if you want the y-coordinate of it, it'll be p lambda l over a. So these results look just like the results for the constructive maxima of Young's experiment, with the exception that we don't have a p equals zero choice which is why we're using P instead of M, just to help keep the counting straight. You still have a central maximum where you'd have a central max for Young's experiment, but you will have, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me here, you'll have uh, destructive minima at all the other locations where the corresponding Young's experiment, if it were two slits separated by A, would have had a maximum. Alrighty, so in this picture here, you are seeing a single slit diffraction pattern um, for red light. Now keeping in mind that blue light will have a shorter wavelength, I want you to predict what will happen to the spacing if we shine blue light through the same slit. Go ahead, pause the video, and uh, make your prediction. Alrighty, and sure enough, it's closer together, which makes sense because the angle is dependent on the wavelength of the light. Now, I did promise that, as you see in this picture here, this was a double slit interference image that I showed you last time. But you'll notice that the intensity of each of the constructive maxima drops off, and then there's a point where it fades to zero. And then as you get further back out, you start to see it coming back to again. And what's going on there is that for an ideal double slit interference pattern, you would have to have a width of zero. Well, of course, if you have a width of zero, no light's going to get through. So your slits have to have a finite width which means that you actually superimpose single slit diffraction on top of double slit diffraction. 
So those dark bands correspond to the diffraction to the single slit diffraction minima um, associated with each of the slits in the uh, double slit pattern that we're looking at. So that gets superimposed on top of what would be a pure double slit pattern to give us um, alternating, give us some fringes being darker than others, including even having some just disappear altogether. So we can just do a quick example of this just to make this a little more concrete. Um, let's say that you have a single slit um, set up and you notice that the angle for the second minimum was a nice typical value of say 0.7 degrees. Um, a typical width of a slit might be a tenth of a millimeter. That's like what you might do with a very fine X-Acto knife cut into a piece of uh, aluminum foil. So what's the wavelength of the light that we were looking at? Well, we can go ahead and say that theta is equal to P lambda over A. We want to know what lambda is, so just do a little cross multiplication action. This will be uh, um, A theta over P. All right, so lambda will be, well, first off, um, we usually, if we're expecting visible light, a useful unit is going to be nanometers. So since this is in millimeters here, we're going to want to convert to nanometers. So we'll take our 0.1 millimeters, and we will note that there are 10 to the 6 nanometers in a millimeter. If you're having a hard time visualizing that, remember a millimeter is a thousandth of a meter, a nanometer is a billionth of a meter, so you can fit a million thousands into a billion. Then, same thing here at the angle, we've got to be careful. We can't just stick in 0.7 because that's in degrees, and this relationship is only valid if we work in radians. So we will have to multiply by pi radians over 180 degrees. And then, since we said this is the second minimum, P is 2. Alrighty. And if we grind that all through, we get 611 nanometers which is firmly in the visible. Now, a couple other points that I would like to make. Um, <clears throat> one of them is the case of circular aperture. Um, diffraction. So here, if we uh, look head on, what our aperture is going to look like is just a hole. So you could make this by, say, just poking a pinhole, like a thumbtack or something, through a sheet of aluminum foil, you're going to have a circular hole. So now if we look sideways through that circular hole, so this is now a circular hole, And we'll say the diameter of that hole is D. Um, you will get, if we look on the screen over here, an interference pattern that looks like this. You'll have a bright spot here. And then you'll have a much weaker bright band around it, like so. And then this is going to be a dark bit in between. and then you'll have alternating rings as you go work your way out. Um, so if I kind of do our little spectral graph thing here. All right, there's our big central max. Something like that. This would be our central max. And then this would be our first minimum uh, second minimum, third minimum, and so forth. 
The derivation is way beyond the scope of this treatment. It is similar in spirit to what I did for the single vertical slit, but you have to use a lot of fairly ugly calculus um, to get what the angle is um, of the first minimum. And so let's quote the result because it's similar, but instead of it being lambda over d, like it would be if it were a single slit, you pick up a factor of 1.22 because this is a circle. And the second diffraction minimum will not be at 2.44. It's just a whole collection of numbers you have to look up in tables. But usually when we're in what where this is going to come into play is when we look at lenses, it's the mostly going to be this first interference minimum that's going to dictate how fine a resolution our lenses are giving us when we're trying to image something onto a camera or something like that. And so we generally are only really worried about this first interference minimum. And then, although it doesn't look exactly the same, I want to revisit the Michelson interferometer. So remember, this uh, came from the Michelson-Morley experiment. So in modern usage, you'd have a laser here. Um, you'll have a partially silvered mirror, also known as a beam splitter. The light bounces. When the light hits this, about half the light will pass through undisturbed, and half of it will bounce off. You'll go ahead and stick a mirror here. We'll say this is mirror number one. Um, and then the light will bounce off of mirror number one. Now half the light will pass through. And the other half will bounce back um, towards the laser. And then similarly here, for the light that passed through instead of bounced at the beam splitter, I'll call this mirror here M2. Um, this light will bounce back and half the light will bounce down here to the viewing screen um, where we'll look at it. And half the light will again pass through. And these halves of light that pass through you use for aligning the system. The idea is you'll want to get these uh, You'll know that a good first step to alignment is just getting the uh, all these reflections to come right back down the uh, the beam pipe of the laser. All right, so usually in these setups, in order to minimize how much things might get messed up, this first mirror is usually fixed and it'll be some distance L1, we'll call it, away from the beam splitter. And then this second mirror here is free to be adjusted. We'll call this distance here L2. Now the interference pattern that you end up getting looks very similar to what you have for the um, circular aperture pattern. It'll be a bunch of rings. Um, so again, you'll have, say, a bright spot and then you'll have rings with bright spots alternating with dark spots and so forth over here. So you'll get a pattern that looks something like this. Now it doesn't have to be a bright spot in the middle, so this is the difference. Whether this is a bright or a dark spot will depend on the round trip distance of the light here versus the round trip distance of the light here. We'll have a bright spot in the middle right spot if the round trip dis the difference in the round trip distances um, so 2L2 minus 2L1 and we don't care about the sign 
so we can and we can pull a two out so two times l2 minus l1 we'll have a bright spot if this is equal to some integer um, so number of wavelengths so usually this will get rewritten as l2 minus l1 equals m over 2 lambda where m is equal to 0 1 2 and so forth so there are a couple of different uses of this in lab tech in lab use one um it, one thing that can it, this can be used for is to very precisely measure wavelengths of light by moving this mirror and counting the number of bright dark bright dark bright dark shifts you have you know how much m changed by and you can read off of the micrometer that you have attached to the adjustment screw here how much you've moved the mirror by by doing that you can then figure out the wavelength of the light very precisely um, the other technique uh, other things that uh, this can be used for um, will turn out that if when light travels through a medium there are effects that cause the effective speed of the light through the medium to be slower than the speed of light in a vacuum this will by inserting that this will change the number of wavelengths there and it'll turn out and you, you can very accurately measure the factor by which the effective speed of the light through the medium changes the so-called index of refraction and you can measure indices of refraction of uh, especially gases uh, very accurately with this um, of course this was famous for the michelson morley experiment where if you rotated the entire apparatus you saw that nothing changed um, through a 90 degree rotation which showed that the speed of light was the same along this leg and this leg um, so <clears throat> and uh, this has also been gotten a bit of a revitalization in recent years um, there are other interferometer designs that tend to be more reliable and rugged um, that have surpassed the Michelson for a lot of these applications but one where it's really shined recently is the detection of gravity waves this is how LIGO works as a gravity wave passes say from a couple of black holes colliding or something passes through the apparatus the gravity wave literally changes the amount of space between the beam splitter and the mirror and we can measure that now for LIGO to work it turns out that the this L1 and L2 are on like the order of 10 kilometers so you had to basically build giant um, evacuated tubes in deserts far away from any uh, vehicle traffic because of the vibrations alrighty so we will continue our exploration of optics in the next series of videos Catch you over there.